We are so glad that everyone is, is here today. Thank you for braving the first snowstorm of this winter season, and we appreciate you guys making the effort to be here today. But we are in part six of our journey through the book of 2 Timothy in a series that we are calling Walk This Way. And last week, as we got into chapter three, we, we read how Paul was preparing Timothy. Paul was telling Timothy of what to expect in the last days, that, hey, you need to be prepared for this. This is how people are going to live. These, this is how people are going to act. And then we made a point last week from this passage of Scripture that not only, you know, are these things going to take place in people's lives that maybe don't go to church, but this is how some people are going to live their life who do come to church. These are things that we're going to see within the church. These are things that we're going to see from people who do profess to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, be aware, pay attention to these things. So this brings us to where we are today in chapter 3 of the book of 2 Timothy. And we're going to begin today in verse 10. And we're going to go down through the end of the chapter in verse 17. But before we do that, let's invite the Lord to help us understand and process the teaching of the word of God today. Would you pray? Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for everything that has transpired already, God. What a, what a wonderful day it's been in your house already. But God, I pray specifically right now for, for the teaching of the word of God. And God, I pray first and foremost that you would help me to correctly teach this passage of scripture. I pray that you would help me to do so in an understandable way so that we could immediately put into practice the things that we learn. And God, I pray for every single person who is, who is here and, and watching this and listening to this. God, I pray that, that you would soften their hearts. And I pray that, that you would allow everyone to, to lean in and, and see where they are in their relationship with Christ and, and, and see what needs to change, what, what needs to be done differently, whatever it is, God. May the Holy Spirit have free reign amongst all of us here today as we open up the Word of God. God, please do what only you can do. We ask all these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know if you've ever heard anybody say this to you before. Maybe it came from a spouse. Maybe it came from a parent. Maybe it came from another relative. But they'll say, be careful who you hang around because you become like who you hang around. The, the whole, show me your friends, I'll show you your future speech, you know, that, that, that people will share. We're, there's truth in that. Who do you hang around? Who should you be around? Who should you be following as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, this works both in a positive way and a negative way. Because if you surround yourself with the right people, with the right influences, the ones making the right choices, that's going to impact you and influence you, hopefully, to do the same thing. So that's going to impact you in a positive way. But if you surround yourself with the wrong influences and the wrong people making the wrong decisions, I don't care how strong you are, eventually, that impacts you as well. It impacts you in a negative way. So the question to consider as we look through these verses in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy is this. Who do you follow? Who should you follow? Who should you surround yourself with? I, I think about it this way in a practical way. If you want to be the best at your job, who would you say you need to be around to learn from them in order to be better at your job? If you want to have a thriving healthy, God-honoring marriage, who are you going to surround yourself with? Who are you going to be around? Who are you going to follow so that there's a better chance of that taking place? If you want to grow in your faith as a follower of Jesus Christ, who do you surround yourself with? Who are you going to follow? Who are you going to hang out with in order to grow in your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because who you follow is going to impact where you end up. And this is true in a spiritual sense as well. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, 
Paul writes this. You, speaking to Timothy, we said this is written by Paul to Timothy. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from all the Lord rescued me. So, so why does Paul start out this way? You, you, Timothy, however, because he just got done talking to us in the first nine verses about those 18 things that we shouldn't have in our life, that we need to avoid, that we need to get away from. And, and, and he talked about in the earlier part here the, the lovers of self and the lovers of money and pride and arrogance and being full of conceit and all these things. He tells them, we went through those 18 things last week. But he says, but not you, Timothy. You don't act like that. You don't live that way. You don't participate in those things. Now, I want to let you know up front, we're only going to talk about two things today, all right? There's not 18 subpoints to point number one this week, all right? And last week was enough, I know. So we're only going to talk about two things, two areas, when it comes to who we should be following or who, sh- who we should be around. Here's the first area. Follow those who follow Christ and who walk their talk. Surround yourself with people who follow Jesus and who walk their talk. Now, we're going to make a reference to verse 10 a lot. If you look at verse 10, who did Timothy follow? Paul. Paul said, you followed my teaching and my conduct and my aim in life and my patience and my love, etc., etc. You have followed me. Now, please understand, Paul is not for one second saying or even implying that Timothy should follow him, Paul, instead of Jesus. He's not saying that. He's not saying, hey, man, just follow me. Don't worry about anybody else. Jesus, ah, man, you ain't never going to be able to follow him. You're not going to go wherever he goes. You ain't walking on water anytime soon, man. You don't need to follow him. Follow me. That, that, that's not what Paul's saying here. He's not saying don't follow Jesus. Paul could say, Timothy, follow me. Because on more than one occasion, when Paul was speaking to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. So he could say, hey, Timothy, follow me, only because he was following Jesus. He writes to the church in Philippi in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. He says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things in the God of peace will be with you. He wasn't constantly telling people to follow him because he had it all figured out. He wasn't telling people to follow him because he was perfect. He's not saying, hey, follow me because I I read a book once, you know, and I read the book of of how to win friends and influence people, so you should follow me. You know, I watched this documentary on Netflix, so, you know, I'm pretty smart when it comes to this, these type of things, follow me. No, no, no. The only way, the only reason he could say follow me was because he was following Jesus. Because following Jesus was the most important thing in his life, was his number one priority. Do you know who you should want to be around? Do you know who you should want to follow after? Those people who make following Jesus their number one priority. It's the number one priority in their life, and you know that. You see that in their life. Follow those who not only proclaim a good message, but they live a good message. Their walk backs up their talk. Now, I want you to know, Paul didn't always get everything right. He's human, just like us. I think so many times we fall into the trap of reading biblical characters in the Bible, and we think, oh, man, I, I could never be like that. I could never do those things. Paul Paul wasn't God. He was a human being that made his share of mistakes. But when he didn't get things right all the time, do you realize that people could still learn from him? Do you know why? Because when he didn't get things right, he did things like confession and repentance. And so even though he wasn't getting it right, people could still learn from his example about what to do when you don't get it right. He wasn't perfect. 
Don't be around people. Don't you dare follow after someone who says they love Jesus more than anything, but the way they live their life doesn't back that up. Think about it. If someone says, I love Jesus more than anything, but their life doesn't back that up, do they really believe what they said? Do they really love Jesus more than anything if their life doesn't back up the fact that they love Jesus more than anything? We've got to be careful who we follow. Let's think about it like this. Does someone's conduct align with their teaching? Does, someone, does the way someone live their life align with the words that are coming out of their mouth? You know what's so easy to do? It's so easy to tell someone to do something that you yourself aren't doing. Especially when it comes to spiritual things. It's so easy to be like, hey, you know what? You know what y'all need? Y'all need some church. Y'all need, y'all need to go to church. Yet whenever anything else comes up, it takes the priority over church in your life. Hey, you know what? You need, you need to read the Bible. What you need? You need to read God's word. And they do. But the individual's Bible barely is ever opened. Hey, you need to pray. Man, there's power in prayer, which there is. But you barely pray for your food. Right, you see what I'm talking about? It's easy to tell someone else what to do and not live their life that way. Be careful. Be careful with those people. Everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus taught, he did. He practiced. And even though Paul wasn't perfect, and even when he messed up, you didn't have to look too far or too hard to see that serving and following Jesus was the most important thing to Paul. It was evident in the way he lived his life. He practiced what he preached. So here's a legit, honest, and I think a a good question. How do you know if someone is truly walking their talk? Because we're not just like just going to take someone at, at their, their word if their life doesn't back. So how do we know? Well, number one, time will always tell. Always does. Time always tells. But there also should be some qualities, some traits in their life. Things like this. If someone is truly walking their talk, they live to glorify God. They live to glorify God. Paul said in verse 10, Notice my teaching and my conduct, which we'll talk about in a second, But then he said, my aim in life is to live a godly life, one that glorifies God. Everything I say, everything I think, everything I believe, everything I do, everything I practice needs to bring glory to God. Not just when something good happens and we're like, oh, praise God, which we should do, but at all times. We live to glorify God. God. Can I, can I share something with you? you, don't, you this isn't reserved for those who aspire to be a preacher one day, or those who want to be a missionary one day, or those who want to be a worship leader one day. If you truly call yourself a follower of God, your number one des- desire in your life should be to live a life that brings glory to God. That should be our number one desire. Surround yourself with people who aim to do that in their life. And you know that by watching them. Surround yourself with people who are, number two, growing in their love for God and others. Growing in their love for God and others. You have, you have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love. Now here's the problem with that. We today, as we, as we get real close to ending 2021, we have destroyed that word love. We've cheapened that word love. Do you know what most people resort to making love? A feeling. It's a feeling. I I, I said yesterday at a wedding ceremony I did right in this auditorium, I said people today think as if they can can feel as if they can fall in love and out of love at at the drop of a hat because it's just a feeling for them. No, love is a choice. Love is an action. Love is always going to be an act of the will. Love. 
Now, I know there's some differences here. And, and engaged couples, they feel love, right? When you're engaged, you feel love. You're like, oh, my gosh, you know, I, I, it doesn't even feel like I'm walking. You know, I can't even feel my feet touch the ground because I'm so happy. And, you know, when you walk in the room, I'm like, oh, you know, I like takes away my breath and everything. I get it, all right? I get all of it. I understand. Engaged couples feel love. Married couples choose to love. When you really get to know that person, you choose to still love them. You choose to still express your love to them. It's a choice. How does Jesus respond to the question of what is the greatest commandment? Someone say, hey, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? What does he say? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love others. Serve God, serve others. You want to surround yourself with people who the most important thing in their life is loving God and loving others. Because it will rub off on you. So here's another very legit question. How do we know if someone truly loves God? Because I'm pretty sure that most of the people I've ever gone up to, whether they go to church or not, if I say, hey, do you love God? You know what they're going to say? Of course I do. Of course I love God. So everybody says they love God. How do we know if someone truly loves God? Let me answer that question with Scripture. John 14, 23 says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my word commandments. So how do you know if someone truly loves God? They do what God reveals to them to do. They do what the Bible tells them to do. They obey God. They walk in obedience. They live out a life of obedience. That's a telltale sign that someone truly loves God. We've got to stop making excuses for ourselves And we've got to stop making excuses for other people. If you see someone who has been following Jesus Christ for a number of years and they are still hungry to love God and love other people, surround yourself with people like that. You want to spend as much time as you can with people like that. Stay close to them. Surround yourself with people who are also faithful during life's difficulties. They're faithful during life's difficulties. When life is dark, when it's hard, when it hurts, when life doesn't make sense, and you watch those people, in their life, do they get stronger in their faith? Are they still faithful in their relationship with the Lord? Do they grow in their faith, or do they give up on God? I don't understand. This doesn't make any sense, and I know a lot of times it doesn't. When life is hard on somebody, and you see them continuing to grow in their faith, surround yourself with people like that. You want to be around people like that, because it will impact and influence us as well. Verse 10 again said, my faith, I still believe, right? My patience, God is working, this too shall pass. My love, my steadfast, I'm not giving up. My persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Do you know when it's easier to walk your talk in the middle of life's difficulties? When you're surrounded by other people who are also walking their talk in the middle of life's difficulties. It helps us. It it impacts us. It encourages us. Verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, a quick note about persecution. And we've talked about this before. Life may not be very enjoyable at times as a follower of Christ, but we really haven't experienced persecution yet. We're getting there. We're getting there. But we don't, we don't face the things that Christians do in other countries. We don't face things that the, the, the early church, that the first century Christians experienced. We, we, don't, we don't have to deal with that stuff yet. For me, I can only speak for me, but for me, persecution over the last 25, 26 years 
has happened more so to us from within the church than from outside the church. Just for me personally. I don't know if you've experienced the same thing. I've taken more shots from people within the church than from outside the church. So that, that, that's sad but true. But what I'm saying is we are going to face persecution, however that looks. Verse 13, while evil people, those who don't love and pursue God, and imposters, fakes, pretenders, will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now let me ask you something. Would you agree with the statement that I'm, about to, that I'm about to make? The world we live in today is getting worse and worse and worse. Do you agree with that? Okay. We shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised by that. Because it is going to get a whole lot worse before it ever has a chance to get better. And we really shouldn't be surprised because basically the Bible, God's word, is playing out right in front of our faces today. Right in front of our eyes, God's word is coming to pass. So we shouldn't be alarmed. And I want you to know that Paul didn't say that in verse 13 so that we would worry and fear and live in fear and walk around and just be a hermit and be like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going to happen, and be so afraid to live life. He simply said that just to make a statement that, hey, it's going to happen. It's going to take place, and you need to be ready. When things get bad, do people still follow Jesus? When things are hard, do they still follow Jesus? Surround yourself with those people. You should want to be around those type of people. Do you know who's earned the right to speak about being faithful in the middle of life's difficulties? The Apostle Paul. <laughs> He's earned that right. I mean, you think of the Apostle Paul, ever since his incredible um, transformation on that road to Damascus, guess what? When he gave his heart and life to Jesus Christ, life wasn't easy for him after that. Life wasn't perfect. Life wasn't without its share of trials. It is, it is well documented. The Apostle Paul's life is well documented in Scripture of everything he went through since becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't pretty. And it wasn't easy. But do you know what everybody could see in his heart and life? That loving and serving Jesus was still the most important thing in his life. They could see it taking place. Paul says to Timothy, Learn from me. Practice what I've practiced. Follow me as I have followed Christ. Verse 14. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Who's he talking about? I think Paul could very easily be referring to himself because we've said that Timothy is Paul's child in the faith. He, he's poured into Timothy. He's invested in the Timothy. But I think even more than Paul, I think Paul is referencing who he referenced back in chapter 1 and verse 5. Who did he reference? Grandmama Lois and Mama Eunice. I think that's who he's talking about in this verse. Hey, remember those things from whom you have learned it from. Not just me, but from your grandmother and your mother. And the second area that I want to focus on this morning, even more so than following those who follow Christ... Can we make sure, number two, that we're following Christ himself as he's revealed in Scripture? Follow Christ himself as he's revealed in the Scriptures. Look at verse 15. And how from childhood, there's another reference to Lois and Eunice, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So Timothy had become acquainted with and knew the sacred writings. What is that? Like, what are the sacred writings? Like, is, is Timothy like a secret original Indiana Jones or something, and he, like, understood all that stuff? What are they talking about, these sacred writings? Scripture. The Word of God. God's holy word. He was acquainted with God's holy word. Let me ask you a question. How do you know who God is? Through the Scriptures. How do you know who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do and what Jesus did do? Through the scriptures. How do we know that Jesus is the only way, that you can't get to heaven through anyone else other than through Jesus? Through the scriptures. 
We know what we know today through the scriptures. You know why? Because there aren't any eyewitnesses left. You don't know anybody who was an eyewitness and who hung out with Paul and Timothy at one time. We know what we know because it's what the Bible says. It's what the Bible reveals. So why should we follow the scriptures or what the scriptures teach? I'll give you two reasons real quick and then we're going to be done. Because scripture, number one, provides the way of salvation. Scripture provides the way of salvation. Verse verse 15 said, they are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. How will we ever know that, that Jesus came to and he lived in this, on this earth, and he died a cruel death so that our, our sins could be forgiven, how will we ever learn that he defeated death, and he defeated the grave, and he rose from the dead three days later? How do we know that? From the scriptures. Because it's what scripture reveals. That's what scripture reveals. When people ask me questions, and they say, hey, Craig, you know, what do you think about this? Or can, can I get your thoughts on this? Can I get your opinion on this? As much as humanly possible, I'd like to respond this way. Well, it doesn't really matter what I think. But this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. Because what the Bible says, how God is revealed in the Bible, how Jesus is revealed in the Bible is what I choose to believe. The only way I know that those things are going to happen is because that's what the Bible reveals. That's what the Bible says. Scripture also helps you align your life with God. It helps you align your life with God. Look look at the the very familiar verse in verse 16, one of the more familiar verses in all of the Bible. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Now, So many times, it's easy to get to the point in our lives where we not only think, but we begin to question God with questions like this. Well, why aren't you blessing me? Why aren't you taking care of me? Why aren't you providing for me? Why aren't you listening to me? Why aren't you helping me? We've all had those conversations. And I think, first of all, he is more than you realize because we either just choose not to see it or we can't see it, or maybe it's because he's doing something not exactly how we think he should do it. And so we're like, God, why does God hate me? And God's taking care of us and God's blessing us, but it's not exactly how we would have him do it. And so we think those thoughts. Folks, Paul isn't saying that, that you know what, you don't have to worry about anything, you don't have to worry about how you live your life, you know, God's gonna bless you, God's gonna take care of you. And here's another thing. Here's another problem. God and the ways of God are over here. You just kind of imagine with me. God and the ways of God are over here. So when we're over here, when we're aligning ourselves here, guess what? Things just tend to work out better. Not perfect. Doesn't mean you're, you're free from, you know, uh, hardship of life or anything like that. But, but things do work out better when you're aligned over here with God and his word. The problem is we ask ourselves all these questions. Why isn't God blessing me? Why isn't God helping me? Why isn't God listening to me? While we ourselves are living our lives over here, doing whatever we want to do, thinking however we want to think, I know better, I know what I need in my life, I'm going to go ahead and do it this way, and you live your life over here, and you're not in alignment with God and his word, yet all we do over here is say, why doesn't God love me? Why doesn't God give me what I ask him for? What's wrong with me? I'm not saying for one second that we align ourselves under God and his word just to be blessed. That's not why we do it. We align ourselves over here because it's right, because it's true, because it's what the Bible says to do. And oh yeah, a byproduct, he he tends to bless us from time to time. That's not why we do it, but it is a byproduct of being in alignment with God. We've got to stop convincing ourselves that we can live our life however we want to and do whatever we want to, and it doesn't matter because everything's going to work out just fine. Says who? Not anywhere in my Bible. 
The only guarantee that things eventually will be fine is if you align yourself with God and his word. And scripture points to that. Scripture teaches that. Scripture helps us with that. So what does the Bible do? According to verse 16, the Bible teaches. It teaches us what is right. The Bible is for reproof. It teaches us what is not right. The Bible is for correction. It teaches us how to get right. And the Bible is for training in righteousness. It teaches us how to stay right. That's what the Bible does if we do something with it. If you change your diet and exercise for 30, 60, 90 days, you're going to see some results. Some. Please, Lord, some, all right? That hot works is killing me, Lord, some. But what God wants us to understand is that if you give yourself to the teaching of God's word, if you devote yourself to God's word for 30, 60, 90 days, see how your life is different at the end of it. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be easy. Everything still may not work out in our favor all the time. But you see how things are different. If we were to go into God's word and we open up God's word and we say, God, teach me, rebuke me, correct me, train me, whatever you need me to do and whatever he reveals to you, we are obedient in that, I guarantee your life will be headed in a better direction. I guarantee it will be. If you surround yourself with people who follow Jesus and you surround yourself with Jesus himself, who those people are following, your life will end up in a better place. It will. I guarantee it. So as always, with any teaching from God's word, we get to the point where we, where we do our best and we teach God's word and we present God's word. Then it's what? Okay, what do we do with it? What do we do with it? Are you willing to walk out of here today With at least the commitment of, you know what, whatever God reveals to me this week, I'm going to be obedient in doing what he tells me to do. Align yourself with God and his word. If nothing else, it gets us out of the vicious cycle of living our life however we want to and wondering why our life isn't different. Why our life isn't better. Why we aren't following Jesus better. It's not about necessarily anything that you or I can do. It's about what's already been done, and it's about us placing our faith and trust in what's already been done and relying on God to do what only God can do. I don't know about you, but I I don't like being frustrated in my walk with Christ. I don't like being discouraged with the way things are going. But I have the opportunity to surround myself with people who are going to help me get to where I need to be. And I'm going to rely on them at all times. And I'm going to rely on Jesus to do what only Jesus can do. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for today. Thank you for every single thing that that happened today, took place today. Thank you for these families that were willing to stand before your church here and commit to being a biblical family a family that adheres to the teachings of God's word so that all members in the family can benefit from that. So God, I pray that as we, as we taught this passage of scripture today, God, as you reveal things to us, I pray that we would be obedient and we would be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God. And if God impresses something upon our heart to do, Even if it's a little scary, God, I pray that we would be obedient. God, I thank you for people in our lives that we can surround ourselves with that that not only love you, but, but but they walk their talk. God, thank you for those people who help other Christians grow in their faith. And God, thank you for the word of God that we can go to 
to, to find out who God truly is and who Jesus truly is and, and what they did and, and what they want to do for us. God, thank you for that, for those revelations. I pray that we are obedient in those areas. So God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will have free reign to move in and out of every row in this auditorium. And as you lay something on our heart, I pray that we would be obedient. God, help us to be obedient today. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen.